I now understand how Mike Holmes must feel. I'd like to take a few minutes to review the work of one Terry Bellamy of Higher Hands Construction. At least, that was the name of his company when I made this video. He and his wife have already skipped out on several months of rent owed to me, so it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if he's tried changing the company name in order to hide from bad reviews. First, a little history. In 2007, my family moved out of country for an extended period of time, and we rented our house to the Bellamy's since we were acquainted with them, and he had done a few small jobs around the house, notably new windows and some tile in the front entrance. There were not enough rooms in our house for all of their children, so we struck a deal that we would pay for all the materials required to finish the basement, including an extra bedroom, if he would provide the labor. As a licensed master carpenter, or so he claims, he seemed capable of the job, and overall this seemed a reasonable deal, a win for both parties. We laid out plans, and I requested permits for all the work to be done, at which point Terry told me that permits weren't really necessary. Well, they are. Structure, electrical, plumbing, heating, a bedroom in the basement that requires a second egress, all these things require permits. I should have run away from the deal as soon as I heard him try to convince me out of permits, but having the extra room was a condition of renting our house to them, so I let it slide and just insisted on having all the necessary permits. Terry agreed. Fast forward five years, and even though he started with a completely unfinished basement, so no demolition work, here is what he accomplished. To the best of my knowledge, no permits were ever obtained. If on the off chance they were, no inspections were done because there's numerous violations of the building code present. By code, electrical outlets must be present on every wall. There are none. The bedroom or office? No power. The area that was to be an entertainment room or a playroom for the kids? Also no power. Over here where he built some closets, and more on that later, you can see a wire running down from the ceiling to behind the wall. I know from previous that it goes to an electrical box that's attached to that piece of 2x4 you can see, and inside joins with a wire coming from a lamp post out in the front lawn. By code, all junction boxes must be accessible, but Terry has just covered it with drywall. There should be a hole in the drywall with an access cover. Also, we had agreed that he would run the central vacuum into this room. Up here on the ceiling is the outlet. I put it up there when I installed the system because I knew it would eventually be run down into a wall when the basement was finished. Terry was supposed to do that, and yet here it is, still on the ceiling. Perhaps he was just planning to run it later. Like maybe after it was all painted. But let's look a bit closer. Without even removing anything, I can see errors. The vapor barrier, for one, is not sealed. Vapor barrier must be airtight in order to be truly effective. All the seams must be sealed with tuck tape or caulking so that no air can flow. It's obvious here that he skipped this. There's no tuck tape sealing the poly to the upper barrier, nor to the support eye beam which he cut around. This means that the vapor barrier is not actually much of a barrier. Also, take a look at this drain. If you look at it from the side, you can see that it sticks out about a quarter inch further than the drywall itself. One has to wonder what the plan was. Just paint it all the same color? Tape and mud to fill the gap? Without any hard structure holding the edges relatively in place, that would crack and fall out in very short order. And what about filling the space below where the drain elbows out into the room? There's no wood for which to attach a piece of drywall, so it would end up just an open hole. The truly sad thing is that all that was necessary was to build the wall one inch further into the room, and the drywall would have covered the drain stack. But the feature of having your sewer sticking out into your room wasn't reserved just for entertainment pleasure. It was also for your sleeping pleasure, because Master Carpenter Terry Bellamy did exactly the same when framing the wall for the bedroom. And speaking of framing, how about those closets? There are two, 
one of which has already had drywall put over the framing, with an open spot between them. The opening was presumably for a refrigerator. Except, of course, there's no electricity run to the area. Who puts up drywall before all the electrical is run? Well, so much for the obvious errors and violations of the building code. As I started to undo the work of this licensed master carpenter, there are plenty of other interesting things. Here is the end of one sheet of drywall that has been put up. It's cut to end flush with the edge of the 2x4 and screwed in, which means that the next piece that would butt up against it will not overlap the stud and cannot be screwed in. The first time anybody bumps that loose end, the joint will crack. Similarly, this T-junction between two walls cannot be drywalled. There's no space between the 2x4 and the wall to slip a sheet of drywall behind it, and there's no framing at the corner to screw the end of a cut piece. The mud covering the corner bead will crack because of movement of the unsecured drywall. Once the drywall was down, more problems became apparent. To support one wall, a hole was cut in the existing insulation and a 2x4 inserted through to brace against the plywood sheeting on the outside of the house. Plywood sheeting is not structure. The wall should be braced against the 2x4 framing. And this piece of insulation has lost its vapor barrier integral in the case of this older product. It should have been replaced with a new piece of insulation, or at the very least, resealed. Now this is interesting. This was to be one wall of the new bedroom. It's not tied into any other walls, and it's attached to the top only by a couple screws into two pieces of half-inch strapping. But sure, let's put the door in. Perhaps the door was necessary because we no longer have a window. The back wall of the room is built such that it blocks the window from opening. Let's dig into the walls. I stated previously that vapor barrier needs to be sealed with tuck tape to make an airtight seal. This is true, but is actually not the best idea for a concrete basement because concrete wicks moisture and moisture will get trapped in the fibrous insulation between the wall and the barrier. Trapped water means mold. The better way is foam panels over concrete tuck tape to create the air seal. Or perhaps the best way is full spray foam insulation over the entire area, as thick as you like it. Pulling the wall apart revealed more than just exposed fibrous insulation. Various chunks of debris and even kids toys were also hidden in the area behind the wall. Perhaps the central vacuum wasn't able to pick them up. He certainly tried to pick up everything else including three-inch screws, drill bits, and more. I guess a proper shop vac simply wasn't an option. And now, onto the floor. As I said, concrete is porous and wicks moisture. As such, you can't put anything organic, like wooden 2x4s, directly on concrete because it will get wet and rot or grow mold. Instead, you install a subfloor. This is dry core. Fantastic stuff. It has a bump plastic bottom to create an air gap between the concrete and the floor and is tongue and groove on all four sides to make a nice solid fit without having to nail it, glue it, or fasten it. It also makes the floor warmer by not making direct contact with the cold concrete. The air gap is vital because it lets any moisture evaporate and will even, in the case of a significant leak, let the water flow to the local floor drain. However, there are restrictions on its installation. Notably, there has to be a quarter inch gap between the panels in the wall to let it breathe and also to catch any water that drips down the concrete wall. You guessed it, there's no gap. All of the edge panels were hammered tight against the wall. Like any quality material, dry core is only excellent if it is installed correctly. I had to use a Dremel to cut a strip off the floor all the way around just so it could breathe properly. Well. To be fair, there were actually a few gaps, like this one, an 8 inch gap with the bottom plate of a wall running over it. There is, quite simply, a half piece of dry core panel missing from the floor. You can't properly slip in a piece later, it's tongue and groove all the way around, and you certainly can't slide a piece of it under the bottom plate of a wall. So what exactly was the plan here? Just cover it with carpet and hope it wouldn't sag? 
But this wasn't the only missing piece. Check out the entire far side of the floor. All the whole panels were laid down, apparently with plans to go back later and fit cut pieces into the remaining area. He can't do that. The tongue and groove means pieces have to slide in, and that's not possible when you're up against the wall. I had to pull out all these edge pieces too deep and relay it with all the cut pieces, one row at a time. Even that was interesting because it became obvious that the floor hadn't even been cleaned before laying the panels. Debris holds moisture. It impedes airflow. You need to clean it. But, done properly, the end result is quite nice. So there we have it. Who lays a subfloor when the true floor hasn't been cleaned? Who starts framing walls when the floor isn't complete? Who doesn't bother with electrical, plumbing, heating? Who puts up insulation and vapor barrier before the walls are complete? Who puts up drywall before insulation is done? Licensed Master Carpenter Terry Bellamy. That's who.